thank you to your beloved pastor, Brett, for hosting us this weekend. It truly has been a massive encouragement to us when pastors get together with uh, the fraternal of men that we treasure. Our friendship becomes alive and uh, the discussions we have are an encouragement to each other and to our hearts in the struggles and strains of ministry. And then to cap it off with a time of corporate worship with God's people, there is nothing more refreshing. And I've had the opportunity this weekend to even sit under my uh, two colleagues here under the teaching of God's Word as they opened it. It was such a refreshment to me. And my only disappointment is that I didn't get to hear from your pastor (laughs) and sit under his preaching, although every once in a while I sneak some recording or something just to uh, hear my brother. Some years ago, we were in the homiletics class together teaching some of our students how to preach, and it just reinforced all that I've ever thought about your pastor and his care and his shepherd's heart. We resonate at every level And that is a privilege, the circle and fraternal of pastors who stay faithful over the years is at times shrinking, sadly, but not among some of us, and we are grateful to Christ for your pastor who has remained faithful. Well, we're finishing off this conference on marriage and family, and we want to talk about this whole matter of the relationship of the family to the corporate assembly, God's people, the church. Take your Bibles, if you would, and look with me at 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy, chapter 3. 1 Timothy, chapter 3. The Apostle Paul says to his young disciple in verse verse 14, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I'm delayed, I want to write these things to you so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. When I got saved, I was 21 years old. I grew up with the gospel, but I walked away from it as a teenager. I would have told you I was a Christian like most church-going kids who grew up with the gospel, but uh, I was interested in my own life, and so I was a vintage hypocrite, of course. And then, of course, in the kindness of God, I was removed from all that was comfortable to me as I signed up for the United States military, newly married. Uh, I was just a kid. Uh, My wife and I were married at 19 and 18 because we were a couple of pagan kids and ended up with an unwanted pregnancy, and we got married and had our child. And the Lord, four months later, took him. We found him dead in his crib in the morning on November 2nd of that year, 1981, which began then a season of instability in my life because all the guilt of my hypocrisy was coming to the fore and instead of repenting of my sin, I, I reached out with my fist and cried out to God, leave us alone. And that's precisely what God did. Sometimes when you pray as an ignorant sinner, the Lord's mercy just starts to give you what you want because he's going to do something miraculous and merciful. And that's what he did. I went into the United States military, and I was away from all that was comfortable to me when I was in boot camp, and then another 10 weeks of technical school. I was away from, uh, from my wife and, uh, and the families that we were a part of, and then I came home and was ordered to a military site above the Arctic Circle in Alaska, and I would be alone for 12 months. She could not come. No family facilities. It was there that the Lord dealt with me And about three months in, I was uh, miraculously redeemed out of my ignorance. And about 11 months later, the Lord redeemed my wife, who'd grown up a Catholic. She didn't realize she was not in Christ. She grew up with faith and ritual and tried to combine them into something that felt like she was 
uh, a believer in God, but she did not know the truth. And, and the Lord was kind about 11 months after my conversion to help her see that, and she came to Christ. Now, here we were with other little ones on the way, and it was, it was brand new to us. These couple of early 20-somethings with this new family, we searched around to try to find a church. And we searched and searched and searched. The, the grace in my life was that my father knew of a Bible teacher in California. Some of you may have heard of Dr. John MacArthur, and they made these cassette tapes. You young people don't have any idea what these are, but they were a little plastic thing. And uh, you put it in this player, and this tape went around, and unless it was warbling and you had to repair it, it actually worked. And you could hear sound come out of these, these uh, boom boxes. And I listened to John MacArthur in my early Christian life, and so I cut my teeth on him. So we were looking for a church where preaching like that would go on. We were at a military base in North Florida. We could not find it. We went to the best church that there was in the area. It was hit or miss what was coming from the pulpit. We might have been a little spoiled listening to the guy in Southern California and making comparisons, but really, all we wanted was someone to simply open the Bible and teach us. We were just kids. We were afraid that we weren't going to know how to parent our, our uh, other children that were going to come into the family, Lord willing. We, we were afraid that we didn't have a clue how to be married. We both came from such a mess. We found a Sunday school teacher at probably what was the best church in the area. We didn't like going to the services, because, but we did because we wanted to corporately worship with God's people, but the messages were weak, and yet there was a Sunday school teacher in there who also listened to the preaching ministry I was listening to, and he didn't know how to study much, but he dug into God's Word each week, and he came passionate, and so we would sit and talk for hours, and I said to him one time, you know, I see the way you shepherd your teenagers. I see the way that you love God's word and the infectious way that that is making its way into the heart of your teens. Would you teach me that as a young dad? And so for the next year and a half, two years of us finishing our time, my time in the military, um, I sat under the discipleship of that couple. He didn't know much, but his fervor and his love for God's Word gave me more fuel for my growing love for God's Word. But we still weren't where we needed to be. And there was a longing in my heart to both study more in depth, the things of Scripture, but also to go to a church where when we walked in and sat down in a worship service and someone got up to the pulpit, we could have a sense of security and settledness that they were going to say, open your Bible, and it was going to be the truth. So we packed up our kids. Uh, by then, we had uh, two little girls and a little six-month-old boy, and we packed them up in a Volkswagen van with about every belonging we had, and we drove out to California from North Florida. And there we were. We walked into that church, the pastor of whom we'd heard. We sat in the very back next to the wall and the center doors in this vast auditorium. And the music uh, helped us to praise the Lord. The leaders who led us in music, much like Dawson and your team, led us marvelously in the doxology that we so longed for in our heart. This is praise. These people sing. They're not just standing around mouthing the words. They love corporate praise. It was palpable, and then after the scripture reading and the prayer and the singing, the pastor got up, the same one we'd heard on cassette tape, and he said, open your Bibles, and we just wept. In fact, we wept the whole service. We had several people come by and say, are you people okay? <laughs> oh, brother, we're more than okay. 
because we knew right then and would continue to know in deeper and deeper ways what we had never known before. And that was a ministry that would reinforce what was so concerning to us about our new family. What were we gonna do? We didn't know how to raise kids. We didn't know what the culture was going to bring. We, did, we didn't know how to defend ourselves. We, we had an embryonic view of these things, very, very basic. We needed help. More than anything else, we needed clarity, clear answers. Notice what Paul told Timothy about the church here. Timothy, the church is the household of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. What we noticed right away in that environment was that wherever you turned, I mean, we talked to the teachers of every class we took, all the way down to the nursery workers who took our little babes into their arms for an hour or two on Sunday morning. We talked to all of them and they said the same things. Every time we asked a question, they all opened some verse to us. The nursery workers knew the non-negotiables of biblical ministry because they were taught from the pulpit. Everybody was about discipleship and body life. There was this way in which even newcomers just got pulled in by the vortex of all of it. And that's what happened to us. So what was happening was this reinforcement of everything we longed for and wanted to impart to our precious children. We were there 15 years. That's where I met this guy. In fact, in 1986, that first year we rolled into town, Lance and I met at a fellowship group, a, a Sunday school context, and he, was, he and his wife were table leaders there, and we were brand new, and uh, so we met, and immediately uh, we noticed about each other that we wanted to talk about the same way to reinforce these principles for family life. So on Wednesday mornings at 6 o'clock, I would show up at his condominium. He only had, I think, two or three of his 20 kids by then, and... <laughs> And they were crammed into this little condominium. And uh, I already had kids a little bit older than his, and so we made an agreement. I said, you teach me theology, and I'll help you sort of work with the new coming toddlers that you have, because mine were maybe a little bit older. And so we exchanged a lot of life in those early years. But 15 years later, I'm, I've been to seminary. I've been on staff at the church, we've learned a lot, and then we came to a ministry in South Florida, and that church had not had the experience that we just had for 15 years being reinforced. And I mean, we raised our kids in LA basically through the teen years, Los Angeles, Los Angeles culture, but it was the church that was the key, right? I mean, the church was the means of grace. Notice again what Paul says to Timothy. It is the pillar and support of the truth. I used to tell my teenage kids, you want answers? I can't come up with every answer. I'm older than you, but I can't come up with every answer, but I know where to find it. You can find it in the scriptures, and the only place you're going to find that the scriptures can be authoritatively proclaimed and upheld, especially with accountability, is in the church, the local church of God's people. Because Ephesians says Christ gifts and gives, gives those gifts to the church. Pastors, shepherds, teachers, and they equip the saints. And then the saints do the work of the ministry until we all attain to the unity of the faith. And we all grow up into the fullness of the stature of the measure, which is Christ, our head. The church is the place if you want answers. It reinforced everything we loved. And so this morning, I want to just briefly talk about the, the most important ways that that relationship is reinforced. When my wife and I wanted to sort of indoctrinate our children 
in what Paul tells Timothy here, that the church is the pillar and support of the truth, there were ways we wanted to reinforce that. And in our final time this morning, I want to talk about that. How do parents in their family reinforce this relationship between the nucleus of spiritual influence in the family and God's people in local church ministry. How does that get reinforced? The first principle we taught our children as to the reinforcement of that was this. Number one, the family belongs to God. The family belongs to God. You say, why is that important with regard to the church? Because the Lord is the one who gives us the means of grace, the means of growth and grace. And Jesus Christ said that on earth, the church is where the will of God is to be done and to spread out in gospel influence to a lost culture. Other things that we do outside of the local church may be life and important, but they are not the pillar and support of the truth. The local church, the household of God, is the pillar and support of the church of the truth. And so if the family belongs to God and we want to teach our kids gospel influence, I'm going to have to have them belong to the local assembly. I want to teach them about the local assembly. The family isn't mine to trifle with. Our society is defying God's design at every level for the family. God is the one who created the family. When he brings a husband and wife together, according to the book of Genesis, they are a family unit. You don't defy God's building in exclusivity of life between a man and a woman. You don't defy how he's built this natural parental sense of obligation into parents to care for their children. You don't defy what he's built in in terms of the love and cherishing of family life. You don't defy how he's built in this longing in the family for legacy and heritage and multiplied fruitfulness because that is what God has designed. And so if he is the one that owns your family and and you don't want to trifle with it, here's what we taught our kids. We belong to God's people. Whatever God may do to save you, whenever he's going to save you, if that's what he chooses to do in his divine prerogative, I'm going to let the church be the biggest influence on you that they can be. I'm not going to be over here separate from the church and thinking I can trifle with something God owns. Yes, the family is an authoritative unit, husband and wife leading their children, but Christian parents who are detached from the church are trifling with something God owns. You don't own your family. Your family was brought together by God. It was designed by God. It has built-in dynamics that if you defy, you already have a front row seat to what is happening when a culture defies that. You destroy everything that is the kernel of a strong society, the core of a a strong society. Worse, you teach your children that the church is an option. Eh, That's secondary. The church is an option, but it's not an option. So we taught our children, look, God owns our family. He tells us what will strengthen the family. He tells us how we can reinforce what we talk about in the family. We're not separate from the church. The church is not an option. We're not detached. Why? Because in the church, there's the pillar and support of the truth. We want answers, we go to the people of God because they go to the word of God. We want answers that stabilize our life to navigate what's out there. We don't go it alone. I see families do this all the time. Well, you know, yeah, the church is an option. Yeah, and I'm not really sure. Yeah, we have family time. And look, family time, we had lots of that. We love family time. What could be more natural than family time? But listen, that isn't a supernatural work. That's a natural work. People without the Spirit have family time and love their family time. You know what the supernatural work is? What Paul says right here to Timothy. This is the church of the living God and the church is the pillar 
and support of the truth. It's the stanchion and footing, the local assembly, the visible local church ministry is the upholder of truth. Truth is our product. Truth is where we get our answers from God's word. We're a family attached to the church because God owns our family. Now that led to a second principle that reinforces the relationship between church and family. We taught our children they must serve the church of Jesus Christ. They must serve the church of Jesus Christ. You say, well, what if they weren't in Christ yet? (laughs) It doesn't matter. You know, somebody said to me one time, well, without faith, you can't please God, and our children haven't professed faith yet, so they can't please God. Well, be careful. Be careful there. It is true that once they're out of the young years and those childish years and they're past young adult puberty and they're coming into adult life, yes, they're going to have to have a crisis of faith of their own. But be careful because even Colossians says when it comes to children that when they obey their parents, they please the Lord. That's very interesting. How can Hebrews say that apart from faith you can't please God, but when it comes to children in the home, if they obey their parents, that's pleasing to the Lord. They might. We don't even know if they're in Christ yet. Somehow God has put into the family this wonderful opportunity for them to be a part of what God is doing in the parents' lives. And so we told our children, if we serve the church of Jesus Christ, you serve the church of Jesus Christ. You're with us. Sometimes as children are coming to a crisis of faith, especially in the teen years or beyond, they've enjoyed the immense grace of a gospel-rich home and life in the church. And as those young people learn to face the realities of their own need for Christ, The church life they grew up in can sometimes become a target of their selfishness. Oh, I don't like church life. It's too many rules. Kids who couldn't wait to arrive at church in the younger years are suddenly saying, I don't like going. I can't stand it. You parents have experienced some of that at times. Parents are sometimes so shocked by the abrupt change in attitude and interest It's as though they assume that one day the kids are simply going to adopt the parents' love for the ministry. Look, none of us us can avoid seeing each of our kids come to some point where they have a crisis of faith and they must choose whom they will serve. You can't avoid that. But you can do some things that reinforce serving the church all your family life that God promises to use. Let me just mention a few of these reinforcing dynamics for the service of the local church by you and your whole family. First of all, don't treat the ministry as a lifeless routine. Don't ever treat the ministry as a lifeless routine. Notice how Paul describes it here. I'm writing so you know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. Highlight those words either with your eyes or with a pen or something. This is the household of God, the household which is possessed by God, the household which has been created by God, spawned supernaturally by God, chosen by God. It belongs to God. And it is the church of the living God. It has life. He is life. He is life in the body. Those descriptions are serious, and yet how many parents wonder why the kids scatter later? Because all the kids saw growing up is that the parents came, their mouth moved, but no sound came out during the songs. It was a lifeless routine, the very thing that the prophet Isaiah warns against in Isaiah 29, 13, when the Lord said, because this people draw near to me with their words, but their heart is far from me. We wanted to reinforce service to the church in such a way that when we got up on the Lord's day, we were ready 
Yes, it is true that Sundays, it just seems like Satan goes to work on Sunday mornings. The greatest arguments, the most prolific conflict seems to happen on Sunday morning, doesn't it? And then isn't it wonderful? You have the magic of the church parking lot. You drive in, hey, hey, look, there's the Dobsons. Oh, they're just wonderful. they wonderful. And you've just been at each other's throats. I get it. But what do your kids see you doing? Uh, You know, one time my wife and I had to skip the service to stay in the car to work through an issue and seek each other's forgiveness. And the kids were in there the whole time. Why? Why is that important? This is the church of the living God. Worship isn't mouthing the words. I don't want my heart to be far from Christ. I wanted my kids to not see a lifeless church through their parents' example. I wanted them to see that this is vital, this is life. Hey, when we're at our worst, I need to be with God's people singing and hearing the the preaching of God's word and have people pray for me. And when I'm at my best, I need to be there pouring it out on someone else so they get to see the splash and the fruit of what God's done in my life during the week. I want my kids to feel that palpably. And even Saturday night, we would often just say as we're praying before bedtime, what opportunities for ministry will God bring tomorrow on the Lord's Day? Don't treat the ministry as lifeless routine. Here's another one under this service of the church. Don't leave your children ignorant of the doctrine of the church. Don't leave your children ignorant of the doctrine of the church. Notice what Paul says. It is the pillar and support. Church is all about truth. Why, Dad, why does that guy's sermons go, why do they go so long? Well, long or not, we, we are sitting under the word of God, the truth of God given to his people. This is the voice of God. Look, we're just humans. It takes us a long time to get something clear. <laughs> we, we can't do these soundbite things. We can't come in here and expect to, to have the word of God opened up and in 15 minutes, we're, we're done. I saw a church advertising one time. It said, you're in and out in an hour and there's a dry cleaner and a burger joint. And I I would say to my kids, that right there, it isn't so much that a dry cleaner is not convenient, that would be nice, wouldn't it? It isn't so much that a a burger close right after the service is over for your kids to have lunch would be, no, that would be wonderful, but that isn't why we gather. We gather and we discipline our minds and hearts because this is the voice of God. How many other voices are you getting during the week? He says it is the pillar and support of the truth. Truth is upheld. Truth is expounded. Clarity comes. We get answers. We talk about those things. Is there anything more important than truth in life? Have you seen so much confusion in this culture today? How much confusion is out there? How many different things have been assaulted in this last few years? Has not the acceleration of it just shocked you? It's making our head spin. Why? Because Satan has put a spirit of delusion on the the earth and God's allowed him to do it for the judgment of a culture that's wicked and our kids are looking at all this and so the assaults and the lies, it's all coming. And now sometimes whole denominations are abandoning truths that have been so conventional, so clear in Scripture and they're abandoning them. And some family's gonna say, boy, I wish the sermon were shorter. Are you kidding? They need to be longer and slower. Longer and slower. Teach your children that this is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. What else is the church? It's a redeemed people, a body united to our head, Jesus Christ. Notice verse 16, by common confession in the church. Great is this mystery of godliness. Supernatural work happens there, we would say to our kids. A supernatural event. Did you know that a corporate worship service is a spirit-led supernatural event? 
This isn't a speech. Sometimes when my unbelieving relatives would come hear me preach, they would come up to me afterwards at home over lunch. Hey, nice speech, Jer. That's what they would say. Nice speech. I'm like, oh. But do you know what the person in the church says? That's a riveting text. That's a great truth. That convicted me. Why is that important? Because the Spirit of God is doing things in the corporate worship event that are unique, they're supernatural, it's the mystery of godliness and who is the testimony of the Spirit's work through his word? Notice verse 16, he who was revealed in the flesh, who's that? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I would tell my kids, when we go to church, it's about our Savior. You don't go to church to priority wise to spend time with your friends you can enjoy that I enjoy my friends at church I don't mind that but you don't go there for that because we go to church because this is the place where our savior is confessed revealed in the flesh vindicated in the spirit what does that mean he came out of the grave by the spirit's vindication make because he was holy and he offered himself to god as a holy sacrifice he is seen by angels that is to say both in his incarnation and his exaltation he's proclaimed among the nations by the people of god who've been brought together by say, being saved in the spirit he's believed on in the whole world there are believers all over the globe and he himself is taken up in glory where he sits at the right hand of the father we come as a redeemed people united to our head jesus christ that message beloved ought to go to your children in their doctrine of the church And the church is a repository of divine truth. Repository is just the word that means this is where you find it. This is where it's held. I love the fact that the word of God gives answers. When we were raising our kids, I would say to them, you're going to ask me questions I don't know the answer to, especially when they're little and they ask you these questions about divine things, you know. Uh, When when was God born, you know, and you're you're saying, well, he wasn't. well, when did he begin? He didn't, you know, and you're blowing your own mind when you're saying it to him. You don't even know how to answer that. But I know what Scripture says, so let's go to Scripture. Well, how do we, how do we navigate our culture with regard to all this uh, sensuality? Well, the Scriptures have answers. I don't know about every situation, but as we get to it, we'll open the Scriptures. How are we to understand God's wrath and God's grace? How are we to understand these miraculous things that took place? How are we to understand that God's people still sin and yet they're going to heaven? Well, I don't always know the answer off the cuff, but I know where we find it. We find it right here. And the church reinforced that in our family life. I loved that. You know, when my kids went to some teacher's class, I, I had tremendous security. And yes, we'd get in the car and I would ask them what they learned, you know, when they were little. And, you know, when they're little, they're all excited to tell you all kinds of things. And it, they just go on and on and on. Oh, yeah, yeah, my teacher said this and this person did this. And, and so you're listening to all that. And then when they get in the teen years, they don't really want to answer because they don't want any scrutiny. So you're like, what did you learn? And they're saying, well, about Jesus, God, the Bible, you know. So you have to draw them out. But... I would tell them, when you get in the car, I want to know what answers you got to your questions. I just want to know how the principles taught to you in a class answered questions, challenged convictions, changed what you used to think. That's what I want to know because this is a repository of truth. It's also a mutually edifying ministry. Right? I taught our kids, look, until you know the Lord uh, and you have assurance in him, I love your awakenings to the truth. You're going to serve alongside your parents. You're going to serve in the church. You're just going to serve people and learn to serve him. But I want you to know this. You're being, uh, you're being given the marvelous grace of other people pouring into you. And that is a testimony of what you will be should you give your heart in full faith to Christ. You're going to be used by God to mutually encourage others in the faith. We are saved and given spiritual gifts and 
Ephesians 4 says we are a proper working part, verse 16, a proper working part in the ligament of body life. 1 Corinthians 12 says God gives you a gift and composes the body so that it has harmony and symmetry as you use your strengths spiritually and your personality and the way the Spirit uses it to embolden someone else's faith. 1 Peter 4.10 says that you use those gifts because you're a good steward of the manifold grace of God. Listen, teach your children. That's why you come here. God has given us gifts in the Spirit as your parents, and we go to church because he's going to use us to grow somebody else's faith. And when you start to understand that as an adult, that's what he's going to do with you. That's why you go. Sometimes church, the gathering of church, is looked upon as sort of this thing we belong to that we sort of got our badge and our club card to and we go and there's some people doing some neat things and then we have some meals every once in a while and a camp for our kids that you know I mean it just seems to us like we've joined this community of conservative people just like some some you know planned community in some neighborhood and schools in some part of your your uh, Areas around the city. This is not what the church is. The church is a worshiping community, a redeemed people under their head, Christ, a place where divine truth is expounded, and it's a mutually growing and edifying ministry. It's also disciple-making. When you teach your children about the doctrine of the church, it's a disciple-making place. Oh, I was so thankful for, for those young people just a little older than my kids who took an interest in them. And I would go around behind the scenes to those young people, hey, keep at it, light it up, fire it up, get with my kids, because I know you're gonna open the word of God and reinforce exactly what I'm teaching at home. And if I need to clarify something with those who are discipling my kids and coming alongside them, I will. We'll open the word, to, word of God together. But go for it. Light it up. I, I am fuel for that. It's also a place that encourages the gospel light that we give to the sphere of influence God's put us in. I wanted my kids to know that the church is the place that strengthens your parents. From then we scatter to the sphere of influence he's given us for gospel ministry. And you want your children to know that the church strengthens you to face what's in your neighborhood, what's down at the local school what's going on at the local university. The church strengthens you to go and be a light in those places. By the time your kids get into the teen years, it's, it's a struggle to stand alone. The Lord does some unique things in some unique young people at a unique age, but quite often in the culture of teenagers of a local church where family life has been fairly stable, suddenly they're faced off with all these ways that Satan comes with these different messages, and they need to know that the local church can help them reinforce that, not by sheer numbers, but just by the truth, because it won't always be that they're with a bunch of people. They may have to just stand alone well do they see their parents standing alone do they see you standing alone or or are you on your heels in your sphere of influence where you're a light in the midst of a crooked generation are you on your heels and you're not admitting that to your kids yeah I'm afraid I'm afraid of being alone standing alone for the truth yeah I might lose my job dad might lose his job I, uh, I'm really tempted to compromise here because I don't want to lose my job and uh, are you talking with your kids about that because in family life the church is a place that reinforces the courage that we have in Christ to take the gospel to our spheres of influence without fear. You know, it's interesting. We raised our kids in Los Angeles, but um, we weren't living in a time like we live now. You who are raising your children, I'm I'm a grandparent. My oldest grandchild of 18 uh, is, is himself 18 years old. 18 grandkids, the oldest one is 18, and I talk with the teenage ones all the time uh, about these matters. I have this great privilege of spending time with them, but I think about the fact that, 
they are facing things, they bring questions to the table for Papa that are just unusual. I didn't have those same questions. And we're just, you know, a generation later than the kids I was raising in a Los Angeles culture. And so I think about you parents who, who have to stand alone now in greater ways at greater cost. But are your kids confident that you would? I always thought about it this way. I'd like to get to the place where if my teenager was sitting around with some friends and some friends asked about some cultural hot button, abortion or politics or transgender or intersectionality or CRT or whatever the issue is of the day. If some other teens were asking my kids what they think, whether or not they could answer it clearly or not, which would be the ideal, would they know what their dad and their mom would say biblically and where they would stand? That's what I wanted. Would they know where their church would stand, the pillar and support of the truth? Would they know where to get answers? So you don't leave your children ignorant of the doctrine of the church, and you don't treat ministry as lifeless routine. Let me give you another way that you teach your children to serve the church. You don't defy the authority of church leaders. You don't defy the authority of church leaders. Hebrews 10, 25. By the way, Paul says here it's a common confession. These are common confessions. The church had all kinds of common confessions in the, even in the early New Testament days. They had all kinds of truths that they would reiterate. Some they put to music and sang them as hymns. But you remember what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 10. We are to hold fast, verse 23, the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And he's talking there about the assurance we have of a conscience that's been sprinkled clean from dead works in the gospel. So we hold fast to that confession and right on the heels of this comment about the faithfulness of God who promised, he says, then let us consider, and that is a, that is a verb that literally means unto conviction. Let us set our minds into this conviction that we are to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And we're to consider how to do it. We're to investigate and build conviction into our minds how we can come alongside people in the body of Christ and stimulate them to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some. There was a delegated authority in the church given to the servants, those who lead the church and are gifted to do it, and they would call the church together. And the church was not to forsake that. And in fact, The writer of Hebrews will say in chapter 13, I want you then to come under those that God has gifted to shepherd the church in that unique burden that they carry. Those leaders, your leaders of this church, come under them, obey them as those who are gonna give an account for your soul. Listen, when we were in our home, Even if we thought a leader were making a leadership decision that we thought different about, we would not defy the authority of those God had set in the church to serve the church in the leadership capacity. We didn't do it. We talked about appeals that have to be made sometimes. We talked about how dad might have to go and talk to a church leader and ask a question about something. We talked about getting clarity in God's word. We told our kids, go right up to the pastor after a sermon and ask him about a passage that you want more information on. You want some information on that, do it. And and yet when we're as a family together, we're not defying the leadership of the church as if this is some sort of, uh, you know, democratic republic where we get to personally vote on whether or not God's men who have the character to lead the church ought to be uh, having a voice in the church's life. No, we don't do that. Don't defy the authority of church leaders. Don't forsake the assembly. Obey them. 
Hebrews 13, 17 says, don't give them grief in this. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? Don't, don't, don't come under the leadership in a way that gives them grief. Give them joy in this, he says. Wow, that's amazing. How easy it is. Instead of inviting the pastor for lunch, just having the pastor for lunch. How easy it is. Here's another one. Don't angrily grumble about people and problems. Don't angrily grumble about people and problems. Did you know that we, we sometimes build a habit in our families of thinking about the church of Jesus Christ in ways that dishonor him? You say, well, pastor, the church is a difficult place. Oh, yeah, it is. I mean, look at the variety in this room. I mean, it's a, we're just a, we're a crew, aren't we? I mean, God just saved us. He saved this room full of people. And if you're a regular part of this church, he threw you in here with a whole bunch of people you didn't know. And you came at the time that it said on the website that the service would start. You came. You don't do that for anybody else. Anywhere else. Unless it's a doctor's appointment. You don't, you, you, everything else is an option, but not on Sunday mornings. Oh, we go to church, and the elders have said the service is going to start at 9 or, or 10.30, so we're going to go. And you come into a room full of people, most of which, maybe many of which, you don't even know. And then you sit down, maybe even next to them, and some guy gets up here like Dawson and says, now let's stand and we're going to sing. They put words upon a screen, and you all start singing together. Where else in life do you do that? That to the world is weird. That's weird. But you know what? You know what happens? There are people across the aisle, uh, I don't like them. I don't like them too much. And oh, the guy that makes coffee, oh, he just doesn't do a good job. And I just, wow, you know. Mom, Dad, uh, how was church today? Eh, uh, eh. Yeah. It was all right. Didn't give us what we want. Didn't charge us up the way we wanted. Why not? Oh, you know, the so-and-so family was there, and you know what trouble we've had with them. And what, what happens to our doctrine of the church? We're told never to, to grumble and complain. We're told to rejoice. Here's what you've done. Sometimes you've taught your kids, hey, I love Jesus Christ but I can't stand his wife. Look, the church is the bride of Christ. He gave himself for her, Ephesians 5 says, that he might present her blameless before the Father. Is she blameless yet? No. Does she have, does she have a lot of unlovely places? Yes. The bride of Christ, his beautiful bride, is not all that she will be, but he loves her. And when you say you love Christ and you can't stand his wife, there is something you're teaching your children that is incongruous and dishonoring to him. Don't do that. Do we have problems amongst each other? Yes. What are we to do? We go to one another. How rich is it to go to your kids and say, you know that difficulty we had with that family? Here's what we're doing. We're reaching out to them and we're going to keep praying for them because we love God's people. And yes, I know what they've done to us. I know how they've said those things to us. I know how that spread to four or five other families, and I know how uncomfortable that gets. But we are going to take them before the Lord and pray, and we are going to do what God calls us to do because God is using it to sanctify us. Can you imagine what that does for your children? And then you get to tell your children, Hey, that relationship got restored. The Lord brought us back together. How marvelous is that? What have you just done? You've taught your children the power of the very gospel you want them to embrace. There's power in the gospel. It brings unity in the gospel. It brings peace in relationships in the gospel. And sometimes you have to say to your kids, I was grumbling and complaining. 
I'm supposed to, according to Philippians 2.14, do nothing uh, with grumbling and complaining. I'm, I'm to do all things without all that. I'm not supposed to throw up disputes before God and what God's doing in our life in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And I'm not to grumble and dispute about the way that he goes about it with relationships with other people. And yet sometimes, beloved, we fill our homes with grumbling and disputing. You get to say to your kids sometimes, you know, I've been an example to you of someone who doesn't honor the bride of Christ. I've complained and I've grumbled and it's sinful, please forgive me. Don't prioritize family leisure above God's people in the local assembly. Don't prioritize family leisure above ministry in the church. I don't mean that you don't take vacations. It's nothing about that in scripture. Those things are us, ours to enjoy. Those are wonderful things. You don't have to really work hard on those things much at all. Certainly, the grace, the common grace of God gives the same kind of leisure and wonderful relaxation to unbelievers. But when you prioritize those things above the people of God, the ministry God has called you to, the relationships he's put you in, the prayer needs that are laid before you. When you prioritize family leisure above the corporate gathering, you are taking your children away from the means of grace that God has given through the local church. You're cutting your family off from the means of grace. I remember many, many families who... Uh, at some point. I'm not talking about uh, always being in a church when the doors are open or things like that. Uh, We have busy lives and we have to make decisions in seasons of life. Do I go to this Bible study or do we take care of this area of family priority and those kind of dynamics? But I'm talking about corporate worship on the Lord's day. I remember talking to families. One young man had finally become an adult and he wasn't around at all uh, at times. The church corporate worship even was sort of a casual thing. And I asked him one time, So I I don't understand. You've got little kids now, and there's this sort of, it's like church is an option, and sometimes you choose family time over the corporate worship gathering. And he said, well, that's what my dad did. And his dad had been an elder. So what you do in moderation, your children sometimes choose to do in excess. We have to be careful Don't isolate your home from the needs of the body. When we taught our children the doctrine of the church, it's the doctrine of the church. It's full of messy people. Sometimes those counseling needs and those prayer needs are gonna come in front of us and sometimes parents try to shield their kids from the difficulty that's going on in someone's life. Not talking about the ugly details that uh, are so undignified or whatever no one needs to know about, but just the fact that... uh, that people have difficulty in the church. You don't want to raise a child that thinks that the church is this place where we all put on smiles and there's no real Christianity. No, it's very real. Messes sometimes come to our doorstep. Kids can't be involved in every detail of all the dynamics, but sometimes it's rushed upon you in your family and you can't stop it. So what do you do about that? Do you just try to, you know, continually shield them from all the gory things that happen in sin and people's lives? No, you just talk truth. You filter it through the word of God. This is, this is real Christianity. Just a couple more things to say about this. Don't excuse your children's sinful conduct toward others in the fellowship. I know, I'm a pastor It's been about 37 years or so, and my kids grew up in the glass bubble of the church and and all that. So you can imagine that, you know, all that happens. But my kids are also sinners, right? I tried four times. I had no improvement. They're all sinners. And um, my wife and I agreed together that when we go to the the Sunday school ministry where our child was, and we get the report. Don't you dread that report? Uh, how was my daughter? How was my son? You know. And if they began to say something that was of a negative nature, we, we just decided we were going to believe it until we knew otherwise. 
Why? Because our kids were always guilty? No, sometimes they, they were misrepresented by another kid or something like that. But we knew this. We knew what was in our children's hearts. <laughs> And even if they weren't guilty in the exact way you said, I know they instigated something, most likely. I'll defend them if they stood for the truth, but I'm not going to make excuses for them. Sometimes as a pastor, of uh, pastor's families, you know, the, the expectation is that uh, the child gets in trouble, so the pastor's going to go deal with it. Or uh, I told my children, nope, you're going to resolve the issues on your own with your friendships. I'll give you the principles. You go resolve it. If you have a problem with your youth pastor or some teacher in a class, I'll give you the principles. I'll go with you. I'll stand there for moral support. But you're going to articulate uh, the things that are on your heart. You have to work this through in relationships just like you do in our family. Why? Because I don't want to excuse my own children's sinful conduct. I want them to experience the grace of the body of Christ in their life. They're going to be confronted. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to have to seek forgiveness. They're going to have to go through real Christianity. This isn't fake. Don't do that, beloved. Don't hide them from the brokenness of the church, but give them the hope that is in Christ. In, the, in his church. Very quickly, just back to 1 Timothy 3, and we'll close with this. He says, uh, in case I delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. This is about coming under the word of God and bringing our heart underneath it so that we begin to become Christ-like. The church is a means of grace, not just because of what it teaches about what it means to live a Christ-like life, but about the way that that work begins to manifest itself in supernatural evident change. I want my children to see the power of the gospel so it's about my conduct, not because it's about behavior modification, but it's because it's about the heart. If their heart is being dealt with by the truth, I want to see fruit in their life. We want to see God's people growing and becoming like Jesus Christ. This is how we conduct ourselves in the household of God. We don't get to define what it means to be a part of God's family in the church, whatever way we want to define it. You don't get to define conduct, righteousness, the heart, the heart issues, the idolatries, any old way you want. Sin is to be defined by the scriptures, and the only way out of sin is defined by the scriptures, and the growth and evidence of the fruit of it is defined by the scriptures. And so Paul says, I want you to know the conduct of believers in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. And by common confession, this wonderful godly thing that God does through the local assembly puts Jesus Christ on display, it becomes our witness. Now in our culture, you're gonna be more and more isolated. Young people, you better you better think about the grace of God through your parents and in this church and through the shepherds and under shepherds and lay people and mature Christians in this church. You better think about that because your culture is becoming more and more hostile and you're getting more and more isolated. So see the church as a means of grace. You parents see it as the reinforcing means of grace for your family life. I've never regretted that. I'm a grandparent now and I... I my kids have taught their kids to love the church. So while my grandkids are still now, some in the teen years, working through whether they're going to follow Christ, at least I know they've heard the gospel, they're part of local churches, and all the things my wife and I had reinforced in our very first church are getting reinforced now to the next generation. If you separate yourself from that, know this, you will suffer unnecessarily. Don't do that. Let's bow together. Lord, we thank you for the grace of 
the assembly of your people, the local church. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the wonderful saints I've already met in this first and privileged visit. I thank you for the pastors and leaders. I thank you for the, those that lead in doxology and praise. I thank you for the, all the behind the scenes. Uh, it's like a little ant farm just running around serving the people and serving this conference. I thank you for the seriousness with which they study your voice coming from your word out of this pulpit. And Lord, I pray that you'd pour your grace upon family life and upon parents. Help them recalibrate in these things. Help them to communicate these things to their children. May it be the centerpiece of their life that we might also have the evidence of your Spirit's work when we're making this common confession of our Lord and Savior. Strengthen this ministry and its outreach by drawing it together around these wonderful principles and strengthen these families that we've had a wonderful time talking with this weekend at the conference. And Lord, we offer all of this to you for your glory in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Please stand with me as we...